Well, uh, good morning. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Haley and Jen, for that. Uh, really good to see you all uh, in miniature in front of me here. I want you to cast your minds back to a time when you were really pleased with yourself. You know, when metaphorically you were slapping yourself on the back and saying what a good person you were. It might have been something relatively small. I don't know. You scored a goal or maybe made a 50 on the cricket field. It may have been that time when you got that souffle to rise, uh, or perhaps when you uh, solved the super fiendish Sudoku in the paper, or perhaps that time when you finally worked out how to make a group WhatsApp call. <laughs> I have to say that most of those things I've never managed to do myself. Or it could have been a time when it was something rather, rather bigger, you know, you passed your professional exams, uh, or maybe you got uh, a promotion. Perhaps you had a successful date. Maybe you uh, managed to get a, get a mortgage for the first time, or perhaps you finally paid off your mortgage after many years. Don't know, whatever it was. Uh, but uh, you were really, really pleased with yourself. You were pleased as punch. You were congratulating yourself. Uh, you were probably hoping that somebody else would congratulate you as well. Uh, and you had this real sense of achievement. I've done it. it. It's happened all by my own efforts. You know, though I say it myself, I've really done pretty well. Well, if you can relate to that feeling at any time, then uh, you've got something in common with Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon whom we've been meeting uh, in the book of Daniel and who is center stage in this chapter four we're looking at today. And Nebuchadnezzar arguably had reason to be pleased with himself. Uh, in the middle of his 43 year reign uh, as king of Babylon, he was without question the most powerful man in the world. He was ruler of the greatest empire of the world, an empire which stretched from the Persian Gulf to the Mediterranean, from Egypt to what is now Southern Turkey. He had been victorious over all his enemies. He had, uh, had scored huge victories over the other superpowers of the day, over Assyria uh, and Egypt. He had made Babylon the world's greatest city. Uh, it was almost impregnable, it was surrounded by a high double wall all the way around. Uh, it was filled with temples. There were ziggurats, those uh, Mesopotamian stepped pyramids, the tallest of which was probably 200 feet high uh, or more. Uh, he had uh, built a bridge over the Euphrates, 400 uh, uh, feet long. He had at least three palaces that he had built one of which contained what was probably the world's first museum open to the public. Uh, he had built the fabled Hanging Gardens of Babylon, one of the wonders of the world, uh, uh, reputedly as a gift to his wife. Uh, and he had built a great processional way, uh, a thousand meters long, paved with stone, uh, lined with um, uh, with, with reliefs down the side um, and extending to the Ishtar Gate. Now, most of this you have to imagine, but the Ishtar Gate you can actually see if you go to the Pergamon Museum in Berlin. There it is. It was uh, excavated from Babylon in the early 20th century. It was taken to Germany and painstakingly reconstructed. And there it is. Uh, Glaze, uh, with, uh, faced with glazed bricks, mostly a brilliant blue, um, and covered with uh, pictures of uh, lions and horses and bulls and dragons and various other real or mythical animals. It's 40 feet tall uh, and it is at least reasonably magnificent. And it has an inscription to Nebuchadnezzar, the builder of the gate and the city which we will come back to in a minute. So there's no doubt that Nebuchadnezzar was pleased with himself. He was very pleased indeed. And that's how we meet him uh, as we start 
today's uh, passage uh, in scripture. But there is a little spoiler alert. It's not going to last. So, Wendy, take it away. Thank you, Chris. I, Nebuchadnezzar, was at home in my palace, contented and prosperous. I had a dream that made me afraid. As I was lying in my bed, the images and visions that passed through my mind terrified me. So I commanded that all the wise men of Babylon be brought before me to interpret the dream for me. When the magicians, enchanters, astrologers and diviners came, I told them the dream, but they could not interpret it for me. Finally, Daniel came into my presence and I told him the dream. He is called Belshazzar after the name of my God and the spirit of the holy gods in him. I said to Belshazzar, chief of the magicians, I know that the spirit of the holy gods is in you and no mystery is too great for you. Here is my dream, interpret it for me. These are the visions I saw while lying in my bed. I looked and there before me stood a tree in the middle of the land. Its height was enormous. The tree grew large and strong and its top touched the sky. It was visible to the ends of the earth. Its leaves were beautiful, its fruit abundant and on it was food for all. Under it, the beasts of the field found shelter and the birds of the air lived in its branches. From it, every creature was fed. In the visions I saw while laying in my bed, I looked and there before me was a messenger, a holy one coming down from heaven. He called in a loud voice, cut down the tree and trim off its branches, strip off its leaves and scatter its fruit. Let the animals flee from under it and the birds from its branches. But let the stump and its roots bound with iron and bronze remain in the ground, in the grass of the field. Let him be drenched with the dew of, hev dew, dew of heaven and let him live with the animals among the plants of the earth. Let his mind be changed from that of a man and let he, him be given the mind of an animal till seven times pass by for him. The decision is announced, but messengers, the holy ones, declare the verdict so that the living may know that the most high is sovereign over the kingdoms of men and gives them to anyone he wishes and sets over them the lowliest of men. This is the dream that I had, King Nebuchadnezzar had. Now, Belshazzar, tell me what it means, for none of the wise men in my kingdom can interpret it for me. But can you, because the spirit of the holy gods is in you. Thank you uh, very much, Wendy. So here we have it. The most powerful man in the world, afraid, terrified because of a dream. Now, we've been here before uh, in chapter two when Nebuchadnezzar had had a previous dream, which had rattled him a bit. And, and we need to remind ourselves that uh, in Nebuchadnezzar's culture, dreams were important. They really mattered. They were seen as the way in which the gods spoke to people. They spoke messages and very often warnings. And so in Nebuchadnezzar's position, you could not ignore a dream. You had to know what it meant. You had to know whether there was something you needed to do to avert the wrath of the gods. So Nebuchadnezzar, he does what uh, he always does. Uh, he gives an order. I commanded that all the wise men of Babylon be brought before me to interpret the dream for me. Now, that actually may not seem terribly smart. If you remember, the wise men of Babylon didn't do particularly well last time. Their track record was not uh, all that amazing. Uh, and uh, they're duly summoned. Uh, and uh, this time, they're told the dream. The previous time, they had to guess it. But this time, they're told the dream, but they're still no use. Just note in passing that Nebuchadnezzar seems to have mellowed a little bit since that first time. Uh, he no longer threatens to uh, cut them in pieces and turn their homes into rubble, which he did before to try and encourage their interpretative gifts. Um, but nonetheless, uh, he tries with them and they fail him. And so uh, after a while, he does what he should have done right from the beginning. 
and uh, he summons uh, uh, Daniel. Uh, finally, Daniel came into my presence and I told him the dream. That's what he should have done to start with. Because Nebuchadnezzar recognizes that Daniel is special in a way in which his other wise men aren't. But he hasn't really grasped why. He says, uh, the spirit of the holy gods is in you. I know that the spirits of the holy gods is in you and no mystery is too difficult for you. Uh, he recognizes that Daniel has gifts uh, that other people do not. Um, but when he says the spirits of the holy gods, you know, for, for the Babylonians, they had hundreds of gods. And uh, so he doesn't really have a concept that there is one God whose spirit is in Daniel and who is able to interpret dreams, even though probably he should by now because we have been here before. If you remember in chapter two, when Daniel interpreted uh, Nebuchadnezzar's previous dream, first of all, uh, Nebuchadnezzar fell down and worshiped him uh, and ordered that incense be offered to him. In other words, he treated Daniel as another God. Uh, but then he did recognize where Daniel's ability came from. Surely your God is the God of gods and the Lord of kings, Nebuchadnezzar said. Uh, but he soon forgot that. And uh, in chapter three, the last chapter, there was Nebuchadnezzar. He set up this uh, enormous image for himself. And when Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego refused to worship it, uh, he said to them contemptuously, what God will be able to rescue you from my hand. And then, of course, God did just that. He did rescue them from Nebuchadnezzar's hand. Uh, and Nebuchadnezzar uh, said this, praise be to the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who has sent his angel and rescued his servants. They trusted in him and defied the king's command and were willing to give up their lives rather than serve or worship any god except their own god. Therefore, I decree that the people of any nation or language who say anything against the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego uh, be cut into pieces and their hands be turned into rubble. He hasn't sort of changed that little bit of it. But he did at that time seem to have realized that God is God. But, you know, time passes, people forget, uh, and it's easy to make a profession of faith one day and to have forgotten it soon afterwards. He hasn't grasped that God is the only God, the one true God, and that God is sovereign over every kingdom, people, and circumstance. That is going to be today's lesson. Anyway, this dream was a dream of a tree, a vast tree, an impossibly vast tree, reaching to the sky, visible from the ends of the earth, a tree with beautiful leaves, abundant fruit, a tree that provided shelter for uh, animals, it provided nests for birds, it provided food for all of them. It's a picture of great prosperity and plenty. So, so far, so good. It's all going swimmingly. But the tree is not going to last. A messenger from heaven comes and commands that the tree be cut down and destroyed, leaving only a stump in the grass. And then, you know, as dreams sometimes do, uh, it seemed to change from being about uh, a stump of a tree to being about a man. Uh, and the dream goes like this. Let him be drenched with the dew of heaven and let him live with the animals among the plants of the earth. Let his mind be changed from that of a man and let him be given the mind of an animal till seven times pass by for him. Uh, seven times, uh, that the word could be translated either seven years or seven seasons, it doesn't really matter very much. So why this apparently wanton destruction? Well, that's made very clear in the dream in the very next verse. The decision is announced by messengers, the holy ones declare the verdict, so that the living may know that the Most High is sovereign over the kingdoms of men and gives them to anyone he wishes and sets over them the lowliest 
of men. That's the point. The Most High is sovereign over the kingdoms of men. Uh, that uh, phrase is repeated three times in this passage. It's, uh, it's there in block capitals, uh, in bold font. It's underlined. You know, have you got it yet? That the Most High is sovereign over the kingdoms of men. That's the point. Now, you might think that actually uh, the interpretation of this dream is not particularly difficult. You know, a, a few moments of thought would suggest that this is a possibly uh, what it means. But um, the wise men either uh, don't get it or maybe they do get it, but they're a little bit too frightened of the boss to say so. Anyway, it's now over to Daniel and over to Wendy. Then Daniel, also called Belshazzar, was greatly perplexed for time and his thoughts terrified him. So the king said, Belshazzar, do not let the dream or its meaning alarm you. Belshazzar answered, my lord, if only the dream applied to your enemies and its meaning to you were, and, and its meaning to your adversaries. The tree you saw, which grew large and strong with its top touching the sky, visible to the whole earth, with beautiful leaves and abundant fruit, providing food for all, giving shelter to the beasts of the field and having nesting places in its branches for the birds of the air. You, O king, are that tree. You have become great and strong. Your greatness has grown until it reaches the sky and your dominion extends to, to distant parts of the earth. You, O king, saw a messenger a holy one coming down from heaven and saying, cut down the tree and destroy it, but leave the stump bound with iron and bronze in the grass of the field while its roots remain in the ground. Let him be drenched with the dew of heaven. Let him live like the wild animals until seven times pass by for him. This is the interpretation, O king, and this is the decree the Most High has issued against my Lord, the king. You will be driven away from people and will live with the wild animals. You will eat grass like cattle and be drenched with the dew of heaven. Seven times will pass by for you until you acknowledge that the Most High is sovereign over the kingdoms of men and gives them to anyone he wishes. The command to leave the stump of the tree with its roots remain means that your kingdom will be restored to you when you acknowledge that heaven rules. Therefore, O king, be pleased to accept my advice. Renounce your sins by doing what is right and your wickedness by being kind to the oppressed. It may be that when your prosperity will continue, sorry, that then your prosperity will continue. All this ha happened to King Nebuchadnezzar. Twelve months later, as the king was walking on the roof of the royal palace of Babylon, he said, Is not this the great Babylon I have built as the royal residence, by my mighty power and for the glory of my majesty? The words were still on his lips when a voice came from heaven. This is what is decreed for you, King, Belter, king Nebuchadnezzar. Your royal authority has been taken from you. You'll be driven away from people and you will live with the wild animals. You will eat grass like cattle. Seven times will pass by for you until you acknowledge that the Most High is sovereign over the kingdoms of men and gives them to anyone he wishes. Immediately what had been said about Nebuchadnezzar was fulfilled. He was driven away from people and ate grass like cattle. His body was drenched with the dew of heaven until his hair grew like the feathers of an eagle and his nails like the claws of a bird. At the end of that time, I, Nebuchadnezzar, raised my eyes towards heaven and my sanity was restored. Then I praised the Most High. I honoured and glorified him who lives forever. His dominion is an eternal dominion. His kingdom endures from generation to generation. All the peoples of the earth are regarded as nothing. 
He does as he pleases with the powers of heaven and the peoples of the earth. No one can hold back this hand or say to him, what have you done? At the same time that my sanity was restored, my honour and splendour returned to me for the glory of my kingdom. My advisers and nobles sought me out and I was restored to my throne and became even greater than before. Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and exalt the glory, the King of heaven, and glorify the King of heaven, because everything he does is right and all his ways are just, and those who walk in pride he is able to humble. Thank you very much, Wendy. Well, the interpretation of a dream wasn't good news, but Daniel give it, gives it to Nebuchadnezzar straight. I mean, it starts all right. The tree you saw, which grew large and strong, uh, that tree, O king, is you. You, O king, are that tree. You have become great and strong. Your uh, greatness has grown until it reaches the sky and your dominion extends to distant parts of the earth. I mean, that bit sounds all right. Nebuchadnezzar probably perked up a little bit at that point, but then remembers what happens to the tree. Cut down the tree and destroy it, but leave the stump bound with iron and bronze in the grass of a field while its roots remain in the ground. Let him be drenched with the dew of heaven and let him live like the wild animals until seven times pass by for him. You know, that's not good news for Nebuchadnezzar. You're going to lose your power. You're going to lose your status. You're going to lose your palace. You're going to lose your kingdom and you're going to lose your mind. You're going to be living with the animals and you're going to be eating grass. And why? Why all that? To get you to acknowledge that your empire, your power, your exalted status is not all your own doing. It's God's gift and God can take it away. That's the point of the dream. But there is uh, a bit of good news in that. Uh, it's not going to be a complete and total disaster. There is hope of restitution. The command to leave the stump of the tree with its roots means that your kingdom will be restored to you when you acknowledge that heaven rules. The stump can produce new shoots. The tree can regrow. You, Nebuchadnezzar, can regain your kingdom, but only when you recognize that God is sovereign. Now, Daniel had been asked to interpret the dream. He hadn't been asked to give advice, but uh, he gives it anyway and gives it actually rather bravely. Therefore, O king, be pleased to accept my advice. Renounce your sins by doing what is right and your wickedness by being kind to the oppressed. It may be that then your prosperity will continue. You know, suggesting that um, uh, Nebuchadnezzar had sins and wickedness probably was a, a little bit of a, a, an agey move. Nebuchadnezzar had demonstrated anger management issues in the past, but nonetheless, you know, Daniel gives it to him. Repent, Nebuchadnezzar. Acknowledge your sins. Turn away from your wickedness. Perhaps, maybe, you will escape God's judgment. Now, there's no doubt that Nebuchadnezzar was uh, pretty rattled by this. Uh, he must have been on tenterhooks, you know, wondering when all this was going to happen. You know, each morning thinking, hang on a minute, is it grass I want for breakfast? No, no, still croissant. It's all right. But then nothing happened. Days passed, weeks passed, months passed, nothing changed. Everything carried on just as before. And maybe, you know, it was just a dream after all. I mean, you know, I have tried to be a little bit nicer to the oppressed. So perhaps everything's going to be all right, Nebuchadnezzar thought. Centuries later, Peter wrote this. The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. He is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. Do not misunderstand or take for granted the patience of God in carrying out his judgment. Nebuchadnezzar should have realized 
that what Daniel said would most certainly come to pass. He should have repented and turned from his wickedness. But no, he didn't. Twelve months later, as the king was walking on the roof of the royal palace in Babylon, now that was a, a place where, you know, you, you got a good view. The royal palace roof was higher than any other roof. You could see out over the city, the city that he had uh, uh, established and beautified. There was a cooling breeze across from the Euphrates. You know, you can just imagine him standing there in the cool of the evening and hugging himself. Is not this the great Babylon I have built as the royal residence by my mighty power for the glory of my majesty? I, my, my. Do you know that? That was Nebuchadnezzar uh, in all his pomp, uh, patting himself on the back, congratulating himself for everything he had done and everything he had achieved. The words were still on his lips when a voice came from heaven, this is what is decreed for you, King Nebuchadnezzar. Your royal authority has been taken from you. You will be driven away from people and will live with the wild animals. You will eat grass like cattle. Seven times will pass by for you until you acknowledge that the Most High is sovereign over the kingdoms of men and gives them to anyone he wishes. Nebuchadnezzar had been given due warning. He hadn't heeded it. He hadn't repented it. God's judgment is carried out. Uh, and in case you've missed it, please note that the Most High is sovereign over the kingdoms, and the kingdoms of men and gives them to anyone he wishes. I mean, you've heard it before, but hear it again. That's what's been happening. So Nebuchadnezzar may have been the most powerful man in the world, but God is more powerful. God is much more powerful, infinitely more powerful, infinitely greater than Nebuchadnezzar. And that's not changed. Many kingdoms and empires have risen and fallen since Nebuchadnezzar's days. Many powerful men and women have come and gone. But God is still here. The same God who humbled Nebuchadnezzar remains the Lord of Kings. But that God is also a God of mercy and forgiveness. And that is what Nebuchadnezzar was to realize. At the end of that time, I, Nebuchadnezzar, raised my eyes towards heaven. Now, Nebuchadnezzar, the great king, was look, used to looking down, not up, down from his throne, down from his palace roof, down on his subjects, down on all the conquered peoples. That's what he did. But now he looks up. He looks up towards heaven. Uh, and he looks towards God, who alone can save him. Look unto me and be saved, all you ends of the earth, for I am God and there is no other, Isaiah prophesied uh, in a verse uh, which famously Charles Spurgeon heard and it led to his conversion. Look unto me and be saved, all you ends of the earth. And that's what Nebuchadnezzar did. He looked towards heaven and my sanity was restored. Then I praised the Most High. Do you notice that? The restoration of sanity is followed by praise to God because that's what the most sane and rational people do. We Christians, we people who praise God are not foolish and deluded. We are the ones who are most reasonable, rational and sane. And Nebuchadnezzar breaks out in praise. I praised the Most High. I honored and glorified him who lives forever. His dominion is an eternal dominion. His kingdom endures from generation to generation. All the peoples of the earth are regarded as nothing. He does as he pleases. And the peoples of the, uh, and the peoples uh, with the powers of heaven and the peoples of the earth. No one can hold back his hand or say to him, what have you done? Nebuchadnezzar uh, 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 tells out uh, a hymn of praise that could easily be found in the Psalms or on the lips of the prophets, but is most surprising when proclaimed 
by a pagan empire. And you could perhaps uh, imagine that this is the second most famous conversion in all of history after only the Apostle Paul himself. It's a new Nebuchadnezzar. Now, you know, note this, he is not totally transformed. Uh, immediately after that, he's, he writes this, at the same time that my sanity was restored, my honor and splendor were returned to me for the glory of my kingdom. My advisors and nobles sought me out and I was restored to my throne and became even greater than before. There are still a few me's and my's in there, in fact, quite a lot. He's still got a bit of discipleship work to do before he uh, achieves uh, uh, that level of um, uh, godliness that uh, he should be aspiring to, but he's on his way. Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and exalt and glorify the king of heaven, because everything he does is right and all his ways are just. And those who walk in pride, he is able uh, to humble. So, was he truly converted? Opinions actually do differ on this, but I think he was. And, you know, the best evidence for that is in the first three verses of this chapter. You probably wondered why we started at verse four when we've left the first three verses to now, but let's have them, Wendy. King Nebuchadnezzar, to the peoples, nations, and men of every language who live in all the world, may you prosper greatly. It is my pleasure to tell you all about the miraculous signs and wonders that the Most High God has performed for me. How great are his signs, how mighty his wonders. His kingdom is an eternal kingdom. His dominion endures from generation to generation. Thank you, Wendy. This chapter is unique in the Old Testament. Uh, it is the only uh, first person account written by someone who was not a Jew. Uh, and it is the sort of uh, letter that kings might write, uh, that bit to the peoples, nations, and men of every language who live in all the world. There are other examples of the same sort of thing. But just note how he starts. King Nebuchadnezzar. Just that. Just King Nebuchadnezzar. Nothing else. And compare that, that very sparse introduction, to the inscription on the Ishtar Gate, uh, which you can read to this day. Well, you can if you read Babylonian cuneiform anyway. Uh, but it, it's a long inscription, but it includes all this. Nebuchadnezzar, King of Babylon, the pious prince, the high priestly prince, beloved of prudent deliberation, who has learnt to embrace wisdom, the untiring governor, who is constantly concerned with the well-being of Babylon, the wise, the humble, there's a whole lot more, but you get the picture. You know, Nebuchadnezzar was not slow to big himself up, far from it. But now he writes just as King Nebuchadnezzar, that's it, just that. Uh, it seems to have taken some time, but I think that Nebuchadnezzar is truly converted. I think he has moved from pride in himself to a recognition that the Most High is sovereign over the kingdoms of the earth, of kingdoms of men, and gives them to whoever he chooses. It's taken some time, uh, it's taken a long time, but I believe that Nebuchadnezzar has crossed over from death to life. So what does this passage, this chapter teach us? Well, the explicit repeated message of the chapter is indeed what it needs to teach us, that God is sovereign. The Most High is sovereign over the kingdoms of men and gives them to anyone he wishes. It's repeated three times for emphasis. That's the point. The Most High is sovereign. God is sovereign. God had set up Nebuchadnezzar. God took down Nebuchadnezzar. God restored Nebuchadnezzar. 
the same is true of every ruler ever since. It remains true today. God is sovereign. That's what we're supposed to learn. And so we should be respectful to our rulers, but we should not be fearful of them. They're there because God has permitted them to be there. They're not permanent. God is in control. And God's sovereignty encompasses not only rulers, but everything else that goes on in this world. Climate change, globalization, the digital revolution, coronavirus, none of these are outside God's control. We do not need to be fearful because God is sovereign. And that sovereignty extends to our own lives as well. The things that happen to us for good or, or bad are likewise under God's control. And because we know that he loves us, we do not need to be fearful. Nothing can happen to us unless God allows it to. to. Illness, redundancy, money problems, relationship problems. God is in control. He is sovereign. And you know, when we're tempted to be excessively pleased with ourselves, cast your, your mind back to where we started, uh, when you're patting yourself on the back for some achievement, when you're congratulating, uh, congratulating yourself, remember that it's God who has given us everything. It is God who has able us, enabled us to succeed. Uh, it is God who has given us uh, our, st our standing, our status, our possessions, our wealth. Everything we have is from him. And we need to remember that because God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. Pride challenges God's sovereignty. Humility recognizes God's sovereignty. We need to be one with Job, who at the beginning of his troubles said this, the Lord gave and the Lord has taken away. May the name of the Lord be praised. Whatever our circumstances, whatever we've got, whatever we're facing, the Lord gave, the Lord has taken away. He's in control. He is sovereign. May the name of the Lord be praised. And then God is sovereign over salvation. Now, at first sight, Nebuchadnezzar might seem a hard nut to crack. I mean, if you were planning an evangelistic campaign in Babylon in Nebuchadnezzar's day, you probably wouldn't have started with him. You know, a pagan emperor, deeply involved in idol worship, full of pride in his own achievements. You know, uh, the one who destroyed the Temple of Jerusalem. I mean, surely that is one conversion that isn't going to happen, is it? But it did. You see, God, it appears, wanted Nebuchadnezzar in his kingdom. And God didn't give up. His grace and his mercy were persistent, even relentless. It took many years. It took Daniel's interpretation of that first dream. It took Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Uh, surviving the burning fiery furnace. It took a period of madness and restitution, but God didn't give up on Nebuchadnezzar. And finally, Nebuchadnezzar acknowledged God. It happened. So, you know, what of us? Do we look at people and say, you know, it's not worth praying for him. He is hard bitten. It could never possibly happen. He'll never become a Christian. Do we give up too readily? Do we cease to pray because nothing seems to be happening? Remember the example of Nebuchadnezzar. Keep going. Keep on praying. Keep on witnessing because God is sovereign over salvation as he is sovereign over everything else. If God wants someone in his kingdom... God can bring that person into his kingdom, even someone like Nebuchadnezzar. So there we have it, chapter four.
a chapter all about Nebuchadnezzar, but really all about God, about the great sovereign God, the one who is Lord of all, who is sovereign over the kingdoms of men, who is sovereign over our lives, who is sovereign over salvation. He is the one whom Nebuchadnezzar learned to acknowledge and to praise. How great are his signs, how mighty his wonders. His kingdom is an eternal kingdom. His dominion endures from generation to generation. Praise the Lord. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this, uh, this truth which is reinforced again and again, that you are sovereign, that you are Lord of all, that you are Lord of the kingdoms of men, that you are Lord of kings, that there is no one greater than you, that you are sovereign over all of our lives, you're sovereign over our circumstances, you're sovereign over the good things and over the bad things in our lives, and you are sovereign over salvation. Uh, you are the one who brings people to repentance and to faith. Lord, we want to join Nebuchadnezzar in praising you. And we ask that you will help us to remember your sovereignty, whatever we face in life, when we are in good times and tempted uh, to congratulate ourselves, help us rather to praise you. When we're in hard times and tempted to doubt you, help us to remember that you're sovereign. And when we're seeking to pray and to witness to those who don't know you, help us to recognize that you can save Nebuchadnezzar and you can most certainly save those whom we love. And Lord, we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.